Well, good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. We are very much into the uh, home straight. The, the last, um, we're well past halfway through looking at all of these um, 91 pages of the um, excellent decision by uh, William Duffin. Charles Darwin suggests otherwise, but uh, I think uh, I'd like to thank Charles Darwin, aka Ken Kratz, for pointing me in the direction of the um, a great article by um, Leo and Drizin, um, which Richard Leo and Steve Drizin um, they did a a look at false conviction con, con, false confession convictions in the in the modern DNA era and we'll get on to that uh, so as I say many thanks to uh, Ken for pointing me in the direction of that particular um, document which runs to about 120 pages but is excellent reading and covers such a lot of detail um, I'm definitely looking forward to, to going through all of that um, but carrying on, as I say, with Duffin's decision, um, this is item number two, um, the introduction of the phone call at trial. When discussing the significance of Das's May 13th phone call to his mother, the Court of Appeals said, significantly, though, the state properly introduced it only to rebut Das's testimony on direct, that the acts to which he had admitted didn't really happen and that his confession, confession was made up. Dassey argues that the Court of Appeals found as a, mat, as a factual matter that the May 13 telephone call was only used to cross-examine Brendan. He points out that the trial transcript is clear that his phone call to his mother was referenced by the prosecution at least three times at trial, drawing its cross-examination of Dassey, drawing its cross-examination of Dassey's expert, and during its closing argument. But the Court of Appeals never said that Dassey's phone call to his mother was used only to cross-examine Dassey. It said it was introduced for only one purpose, which was to, to rebut Thus, his testimony on direct that the acts to which he had admitted didn't really happen and that his confession was made up. Evidence introduced for only one purpose might be used multiple times in various ways and with many different witnesses. What the Court of Appeals said was accurate and not unreasonable. Three. The legal standard applied by the Court of Appeals. Regarding the admission of Das's phone call to his mother, the Court of Appeals also said voluntary statements obtained even without proper Miranda warnings are available to the state for the limited purposes of impeachment and rebuttal. Dassey argues that the Court of Appeals acted contrary to clearly established federal law by applying the wrong legal standard to his claim. The Court acknowledges that the Court of Appeals' statement that voluntary statements obtained even without proper Miranda warnings are available to the state for the limited purpose of impeachment and rebuttal is confusing given the context of this case. Dassey never claimed that his call to his mother should have been excluded because it was made without the benefit of his Miranda warnings. The court suspects that the Court of Appeals was merely attempted to analogise the... An analogise? I don't know why. Anal analogise, I'm going to go with. The admission of a statement obtained in violation of Sullivan to the admission of a statement obtained in violation of Miranda. Whether such a comparison is sound is a question this court need not determine. The Court of Appeals decision is clear that this was not the basis for its rejection of Das's claim. The statement was extraneous and immaterial. 
Thus, the court cannot conclude that Dassey has shown that the Court of Appeal's decision denying him relief on his Sullivan claim was contrary to clearly established federal law or based upon an unreasonable determination of facts. Item B. The voluntariness of Dassey's March 1st, 2006 confession. The United States Supreme Court has long held that certain interrogation techniques, either in isolation or as applied to the unique characteristics of a particular su suspect, are so offensive to a civilised system of judgment, justice that they must be condemned, condemned under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. This includes the sorts of means that are revolting to the sense of justice, such as beatings and other forms of physical and psychological torture, but the Constitution prohibits far more than barbaric and torturous conduct. Indeed, more subtle police pressures, such as a false promise of leniency, may render a confession involuntary. If a confession is the product of deceptive interrogation tactics, that have overcome the defendant's free will. The confession is involuntary. In determining whether a defendant's will was overborne in a particular case, the court has assessed the totality of all the surrounding circumstances, both the characteristics of the accused and the details of the interrogation. The voluntariness of juvenile confessions must be evaluated with special care. Relevant factors include the length of the interrogation, its continuity, the defendant's maturity, education, physical condition and mental health. Coercive policing, police activity is a necessary predicate to the finding that a confession is not voluntary within the meaning of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. A, a, a confession is not involuntary merely because the actions of the police caused the person to confess. And a defendant's deficient mental condition, standing alone, will not sustain a finding of involuntariness. Whether a statement was voluntary is a question of law, Though the voluntariness of a confession is an issue of law, the factors underlying that determination are issues of fact to which uh, Statute 2254, Presumptions of Correctness, applies. Determinations of factual issues made by the State Court are presumed correct in Federal habeas corpus proceedings unless the petitioner rebuts that pre presumption by clear and convincing evidence. The presumption of correctness also applies to factual findings made by a state court of review based on the trial record. Thus, a decision involves an unreasonable determination of facts if it rests upon fact-finding that ignores the clear and convincing weight of evidence. As recounted by the Court of Appeals, the State Trial Court found the following facts regarding Dassey's March 1st confession. Dassey had a low average to borderline IQ, but was in mostly regular track high school classes, was interviewed while sitting on an upholstered couch, never was physically restrained and was offered food, beverages and restroom breaks, was properly Mirandized and did not appear to be agitated or intimidated at any point in the questioning. Investigators used normal speaking tones with no hectoring, threats or promises of leniency, prodded him to be honest as a reminder of his moral duty to tell the truth and told him they were in his corner and would go back for him to try to achieve a rapport with Dassey and to convince him that being truthful would be in his best interest. The Court of Appeals held that these findings of fact were not clearly erroneous. It noted 
that investigators are permitted to make statements that encourage honesty and do not promise leniency. Moreover, investigators may assert that they know facts of which they do not actually have knowledge. The truth of the confession remained for the jury to determine. Next, paragraph one, similar cases. In a number of post-AEDPA cases, the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit addressed the question of whether a state court unreasonably conclu concluded that a juvenile's confession was voluntary. Some of these cases deal with sufficiently and analogous circumstances such that the court finds it helpful to look at them, to look to them in guiding the present decision. In Carter versus Thompson, back in 2012, the court denied habeas relief to a 16-year-old girl who was kept in the police station for 55 hours, never told she was free to leave, never afforded her the opportunity to shower or change, or given a change of clothes, a pillow or a blanket, and who had to sleep on a bench in the interview room. She was repeatedly subjected to questioning. No parent or other adult protecting her interests was present until after she had confessed. Well, I think that's just totally embarrassing, Wisconsin. But anyway, you know, um, in fact, it doesn't say that it's Wisconsin, America. That is, that is an embarrassment, that is, that that happened. Um, there's no other way of saying it, I'm afraid. While referring to the circumstances as unsettling, that's weasel words, weasel, weasel words. The court ultimately concluded that the state court's decision holding that her confession was voluntary was not objectively unreasonable. <laughs> I think we know who's been objectively unreasonable in a decision like that. In Etherley versus Davis, Etherley was a 15 year old's illiterate enrolled in special education classes and had borderline intellectual functioning. When police officers went to his home at about 5.30 and took him to the police station for questioning about his involvement in a murder, he had no prior involvement in the criminal justice system and no parent was present during the interview. Two hours after arriving at the station, detectives undertook a brief unproductive interview of him. After a uniformed officer took Etherley to the restroom, Etherley informed the detectives that the uniformed officer had told him that he had an obligation to tell the truth and that it would go better for him in court if he helped the police to locate the guns. A detective responded that they could not make any promises but said they would inform the court of his assistance. Etherley then provided an inculpatory statement. The Court of Appeals determined that the State Court was not unreasonable in finding that Etherley's statements was voluntary. Well, that's quite a significant difference to the 16-year-old uh, girl case. In Hardaway versus Young, back in 2002, the suspect was just 14 years old when he was questioned about murdering an 11-year-old gang member. Detectives roused Hardaway from sleep at his home at about eight o'clock in the morning and took him to the police station where they questioned him briefly before he spent most of the next eight hours alone in an interview room. Two new detectives advised Hardaway of his Miranda rights and proceeded to question him. Hardaway confessed. Given Hardaway's extreme youth, the Court of Appeals carefully scrutinised the circumstances of his confession, including the fact that there was no friendly adult presence to guard him against undue police influence. But the court noted other facts that tended to support a finding that the confession was voluntary. The police used no particularly coercive or heavy-handed interview techniques, such as making Hardaway strip and wear jail clothes or handcuffs, questioning him for lengthy periods without a break, misrepresenting evidence, or showing graphic pictures of the murder scene. Hardaway 
was experienced with the criminal justice system, having been arrested 19 times in the preceding two years. He appeared to understand his Miranda rights in that he was able to explain them in his own words. There was no indication that Hardaway had mental incapacities or other infirmities that would make him incapable of understanding his rights. His test scores showed an IQ of 95 and the educational performance of an average sixth grader. Despite the gravest misgivings, the Court of Appeals reluctantly concluded that given the deferential standards set forth under EDPA, it was compelled to defer to the findings and the conclusion of the state courts because reasonable minds could differ. Conversely, in AM versus Butler 2004, the court affirmed the district court's grant of the writ to a petitioner who was who at 11 years old confessed to the brutal murder committed when he was 10 years old of his 83 year old neighbor initially regarded as a witness the youth was questioned numerous times and told various versions of the relevant of events eventually repeating admit repeatedly admitting to the murder However, once his mother was located and joined him in the interrogation room, he recanted. Later, he purportedly admitted the murder to his mother, a point disputed by his mother at trial. According to the petitioner, a detective pounded on his knees, told him his fingerprints were on the murder weapon, and said that if he confessed, God and the police would forgive him and he could go home in time for his brother's birthday party. The court emphasised that the petitioner was not a seasonal, seasoned juvenile delinquent. In fact, he had no prior experience with the criminal justice system. When he was questioned for almost two hours in a closed interrogation room with no parent, guardian, lawyer or anyone at his side, a detective continually challenged the petitioner's statements and accused him of lying, a technique which could easily lead to a young boy to confess to anything. The court affirmed the district's court decision to grant the writ. This is when it gets interesting. <laughs> Where have we heard this name before? In dissent, Judge Easterbrook accused the majority of continuing to apply the pre AEDPA standard of review. In his view, affording the state court decision the significant deference required under EDPA, the court was required to deny the writ. He noted that the detective did not attempt to overbear the petitioner's will, treat him poorly or hold him for extended periods, and the petitioner repeated his confession many times after the relevant interview. Obviously, Judge Easterbrook was the one that remained silent, but listened, apparently intently, on the uh, on-bank hearing for uh, Brendan Dassey. Uh, but we, of course, by not speaking, we were never sure which way he was likely to go. It was clear that it was three all, and we were really depending on him to show a little bit of uh, common sense. But clearly, um, he's had uh, issues with this in the past. Okay. Reliability as a factor under the totality of the circumstances. Dassey argues that during the March 1st interrogation, the investigators repeatedly fed him facts, including facts that were not known, but not publicly known. Such fact feeding could suggest that Dassey's confession was not reliable. Thus, as a preliminary question, the court considers whether the reliability of Dassey's confession is a factor that the court should take into account when assessing whether Dassey's confession was voluntary under the totality of the circumstances. Intuitively, one would not expect Dassey to provide the level of detail he did on March 1st had he not been involved in the events he described. Because, of course, we know that he made up a lot of things. Um, sometimes he was given the option, did you do this or did you do that? But yes, he, he did make up a lot. And we know for a fact, he said he guessed. Well, he guessed constantly. He, he guessed all the way through, unless there was things that he'd heard um, in conversation or on the news. 
Anyway, the prosecution em emphasised as much in its closing arguments, as I say, saying that, that um, if you take all the stuff that Brendan said, uh, you know, you, you've got this ridiculous story, but there's a lot of detail in there. Um, so as I say, the, the prosecution emphasised as much in its closing argument, people who are innocent don't confess in the detail provided to the extent this defendant provided it. <clears throat> they don't do that. Now then, this is the bit that we've been looking forward to. <laughs> Research, however, shows that some people do make detailed confessions to crimes they did not commit. And, and it's got a, in brackets, I have no idea what all this means, ECF number 19 to 27 at 202 to 08. But then it says, see also Stephen A. Drizzen and Richard A. Leo, the problem of false confessions in the post-DNA world. Hmm. Document printed in 2004, documenting 125 proven false confessions presented as an exhibit by the state in its cross-examination of Leo at Das's post-conviction hearing and discussed at length. So this is, as I say, this is what Charles Darwin was alerting us to. We know that uh, um, Richard Leo was... Uh, a, a um, an expert witness in the uh, in the, 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 the appeals that uh, Brendan had, and as I say, I'm reading this document. This um, the problems of the problem of false false confessions in the post DNA world. It's excellent. First thing it deals with the Central Park Five. Well, that immediately got me interested. Anyway, we'll we'll be looking at that as well. Let's carry on though. Um, so yes. Ken Cratch, you're absolutely right. They do, they do, the judge does cite this, this article. But where else are you going to get expertise of that kind of level? Now, as I say, just compare that, Charles, Ken. You said, what if the Seventh Circuit had cited my book? Do you seriously think, do you ser are you that deluded? You seriously think that the Seventh Court would cite a book that's been written by a, a deposed, a deposed, um, despised, um, flawed, a morally corrupt, disgraced former district attorney. That's another thing we're going to have a look at. I'm, I'm going to look at the, um, if you like, the, 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 the duties of district attorneys. We, we've got the district attorney's oath. The, the, the oath that they have to take but I want to look a little bit more deeply into into what it is you know why why do we even need a district attorney what you know what 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 is his function what what is he supposed to do compared with what Ken Kratz did anyway I'm uh, losing the uh, place where I was so let's um so let's carry on with um as I say the um the the, the um Richard, Richard Leo's book um, documenting 125 pro proven false confessions presented as an exhibit. Um, another book or article was by Brandon Garrett, The Substance of False, false Confessions, examining multiple cases where individuals confessed to crimes for which they were later exonerated by DNA testing noting that many of the false confessions included details of how the crime had occurred. Study relied upon, a, upon by Leo in his testimony at Das's post-conviction hearing. So Leo relied on this other book um, about the um, false confessions. And I suppose another, another thing to bear in mind is, I wonder if, if anybody's ever done a book that says that all these experts in false confessions, they're all wrong, that in fact, um, you know, this doesn't happen. There's nobody that's come out and said, you know, false confessions don't happen. Because we're finding out that in 25% of juvenile false convictions that's proven false by DNA, that it's um, a false confession 
that has, that has caused a big problem, that they have given a false confession, and then they have been found innocent. Um, moreover, false confessions are especially likely among juveniles and persons with low IQs. As I say, no, I don't know of anybody that could possibly have written a book that says that that, that, that isn't the case. Okay, and then he cites again, see also Stephen A. Drizzen and Richard A. Leo, the problem of false confessions in the post-DNA world. Other traits, such as low self-esteem, aversion to conflict and poor memory, tend to make a person more susceptible to false confessions. One ex explanation for the level of detail in false confessions is that the suspect learned the details through the media, family, friends, or from investigators as part of the questioning process. Once again, see the book by Brandon Garrett, The Substance of False Confessions. Um, Yander's testimony regarding Das's exposure to the media coverage and family discussions of the case is put in brackets. The investigation and prosecution of Avery garnered significant media attention in Wisconsin and nationally. And it gives an example. See Kevin Braley, Holback case draws a media crowd, a Herald Times reporter. Manitowoc, Wisconsin, November 23rd, 2005. And of course, if you want to know how the, uh, how the media was handling the case, just head over to Millbilly's channel and you'll get all the uh, phone conversations, for example, of, with Steve, with various members of the media. The prosecution emphasised that details Dassey provided were corroborated by other evidence. <laughs> However, the details that Dassey provided were predominantly either matters that had been publicly disclosed or could be easily surmised from those facts. For example, long before Dassey's March 1st confession, it had been reported in the media that Halbach's RAV4 was found in the salvage yard partially concealed by branches and a car hood, that her remains were found in Avery's burn pit, along with remnants of clothing, that Avery burned tyres on the night Holbach was last seen, that 11 rifle casings were found in Avery's garage, that two rifles were recovered from Avery's bathroom, bedroom, not his bathroom, I'm sure he doesn't keep them in the bathroom, bedroom, sorry, that a key to Holbach's RAV4 was found in Avery's bedroom, that the key had Avery's DNA on it, that Avery's blood was found in Halbach's RAV4, and that Halbach's blood was found in the cargo area of the RAV4. Again, he, he, he cites a report by Kevin Braley, Avery bound over for trial, and um, another article by him, Homicide Charge Filed, November 16, 2005. Certain other details, such as the fact that Halbach had been shot in the head and that the battery to the RAV4 had been dis dis disconnected, apparently had not been publicly disclosed as of March 1st, 2006. However, how Dassey came to say that Avery shot Halbach in the head offers perhaps the strongest indication that Dassey was, as he later would claim, at times guessing at the answers in an attempt to provide the investigation investigators with the information they said they already knew. The investigators knew that Harbuck had been shot in the head and repeatedly told Dassey that they knew something else was done, something with the head. Dassey first said that Avery cut off her hair. His inflection suggesting more a question than a statement. Well, that's absolutely spot on. After more prompting from the investigators, he then said that Avery punched her. Yet more prompting led to Dassey saying that, at Avery's direction, he cut Halbach's throat. Despite more prompting, eventually Dassey stated, that's all I can remember. Or should we put, instead of remember, that's all I can guess. That's as far as my imagination will go. Having unsuccessfully gotten Dassey to tell them that Holbach had been shot in the head, much less who had shot her, Wiegert finally said, 
You know the line. All right, I'm just going to come out and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did, <laughs> Darcy replied. When asked why he did not say so earlier, Darcy said, because I couldn't think of it. Um, I think we've only got maybe one more part to go, but I'm going to hold it there. And so I'm going to do a bit more reading of this this excellent article by uh, Richard Leo and um, Steve Drizzen. I will include it in the description. So start having a read of that. Um, and as I say, I also want to look in, in, in more. My, I might I might ask the dude himself what his thoughts are on, on what a uh, district attorney should and shouldn't be doing. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure we could get some other examples of um, of where this confession by Brendan Dassey went uh, went astray, particularly with the uh, control question. Anyway, we'll um, catch you again soon. Bye for now.